with the trigonal distorted pyramidal system for the copper protein. Hmm. So, we are talking about <coughs> copper proteins which is severely distorted. So, we have seen that the coercing sphere was N 2 S 2 and if we have a environment which is trigonal in nature which can be both favorable to copper 1 and copper 2 that we have seen our last class. But if we just simply compare the corresponding distances which is sulfur from the methionine, sulfur from the cysteine and the nitrogens from histidine. So, this is S methionine. So, here for this 2 histidine and we were talking for both <coughs> copper 2 and copper 1. And in case of copper 2, the distances were such that this is the longest one, this was the distorted one, hmm, the methionine one, which is around 2.9 angstrom. Hmm, it is pretty high the distance compared to the nitrogen distances, the copper nitrogen distances, which we know that all are close to 2, that means 2 angstrom. So, which is 2.10 angstrom and other one is 2.04 angstrom and cysteine in sulfur is also close to that nitrogen one which is 2.13 angstrom. So, when we see all the three distances and at the same time when we know the variation in the angles, so all these angles that means the sulfur copper nitrogen, nitrogen copper nitrogen or sulfur copper. So, all these things, so how do we know that they are preferring some geometry where we all know that copper 1 will be preferring a tetrahedral one which should be highly distorted and this one should be a square based one. So, in between either a square planar or a square pyramidal for copper 2. But in between what we are getting that means we are getting some intermediate geometry which has a symmetry level of C 3 V which is like that of our pyramidal one. So, these two basically support both the environment. So, angles also do vary within a wide range of 85 to 132 degree you see how distorted they are. So, these values basically these angle values will immediately tell us the amount of distortion. So, when we talk about these distances and this is for copper 2, so this is for the plus 2 species. So, obviously, if we can make a table for the other bond distances that means, the corresponding bond distances of copper 1, we can find out that how these distances will change and not only this change which is reflected for the oxidation state change from copper 2 to copper 1. Because when you move from plus 2 to plus 1, obviously, all the distances will cha change, but some of these distances will change more. So, in this particular case you will have certain arrangement that means your protein envelope should support these distortions.
So, you have plus 1 and plus 2 and you have for plus 1 we are just giving these distances for plus 1 you have the corresponding these distances 4 distances 2 copper nitrogen and 2 copper sulfur distances. And one more interesting thing is also there that if you bring something over there that means the pH we can determine the structure also at two different pH one is close to 7 and another say close to 3. So, at these two values that means if you just consider that your medium is little bit acidic close to 3.0 we will see that there are certain positions including your imidazole ring and the cysteine sulfur and the protein environment. So, there will be some positions which can be immediately protonated. So, basically what we get, so if we just consider the distances, we will have two distances for the two different oxidation states and there are other also set of distances for two different pH values. So, depending on this that means when we talk that if you just simply change that means these two change what we are getting for this copper 2 and copper 1 this basically is dependent on electron transfer. So, during that electron transfer our structural change is also taking place that means distortion is taking place during electron transfer as well as when you change the pH your structure is again changing. So, at which particular pH you are measuring this electron transfer because we are what we are looking for we are basically looking for you have 2 sulfur 2 nitrogen that reduction. So, if we see that there is some chance that means in the deprotonated form that means when your medium is neutral or slightly basic your electron transfer will be facilitated. So, four structures as well as you will have that different E 0 values. So, whenever we report these E 0 values for those electron transfer you should also report the corresponding pH. So, there will be something that means you have basically this proton which supplying the electron and that electron will control your electron transfer. Either it will be facilitated at basic pH or in the acidic pH, but basically it will be facilitated in the basic pH when you have more charge on the copper center. So, these two things that means these two are very much interrelated that means we should not neglect like our simple molecules that what is the corresponding pH medium that means this can also certain positions which can be protonated if you have some distant groups also that means nitrogen at distant position also which is nearby that means this particular nitrogen imidazolidin ring which is nearby, but not directly attached to the copper center, but it protonation level will do contribute to the electron transfer as potential as well as electron transfer rate. So, these are the very simple things for type 1 electron transfer. So, when you have a type 1 site, you have a mononuclear system, but this mononuclear system can transfer that electron which is dependent on the pH value of the medium. So, next after type 1 we should just have some interesting informations about the type 2 copper proteins. So, first when we see that this is the type 2 copper protein sometime they are also known as a normal type. And what immediately we can do is that whether that particular one 
is colored or not. Hmm. What is the color of the system? Because the previous one we started <coughs> excuse me, our characterization from the color. That means, you have a strong charge transfer band due to the cysteine in sulfur to the cupric copper. But in this particular case, this one is very faintly colored that means, we can consider that they are non blue system. And also for its EPR characterization, so electronic spectra can differentiate in the liquid state in the solution state whether you are handling a type 1 system or a type 2 system by looking at the color only. Yes, so, there is no need to find out the corresponding lambda value or epsilon value. Similarly, the electron paramagnetic resonance also <coughs> can give some information about the nature of the corresponding protein center. So, we have seen that the typical spectral pattern is this which is a axial type of spectrum and when you have the copper 63 I value which is 3 by 2. So, the splitting is 2 I plus 1 we get 4 lines. and four lines this is the g parallel region, this is the g perpendicular region. So, this particular one will be splitted into two four lines. Hmm. So, average one so out of these four signals the average one is your g parallel value and the next one is g perpendicular value and somewhere at these positions you will have the reference one which is dpph hmm, which has a g value of 2.0037 so if we see that is sometime it would be little bit confusing that the copper type 1 site that is the type 1 site also has this sort of axial spectrum and copper 2 also has this axial spectrum. But these values if there is also because sometimes we find that there is also splitting in the perpendicular region also. So, that if there is splitting so in this particular region we find that these values hmm, this is a hyperfine constant hmm, hyperfine splitting constant due to the copper center hmm. so is a metal centered hyperfine splitting Because sometime we see also that when copper when here is also directly bound to the nitrogen site and nitrogen has also some I value. Hmm. So, if there is some interactions with the electron spin of the metal center and the nuclear spin of the nitrogen then there is another type of splitting, but which is very small which is known as we put some super that is super hyperfine splitting and we designate that as small a values. So, these values, so since we have the splitting in this region, so A values, if we just simply compare these A values, so in the previous case A values was less is 0.95 into 10 to the power minus 4 centimeter inverse, but in this particular case it is bigger compared to those values which is minus 10 to the power minus 4 centimeter inverse. For type 1 it is 0 0.95 hmm. and compared to 0 0.95 you have 114 to the minus 4 centimeter inverse. So, the G value will tell you 
that the spacing of the lines. So, this a perpendicular hyperfine splitting is nothing but the spacing of the lines. So, we get something that means type 2 we get and it is responsible for large number of reactions. So, one such reaction is the simple oxidation reaction and that is responsible for the reaction where the galactose is involved. So, which is known as galactose oxidase. So, substrate is nothing but your D galactose. So, D galactose in your hand and in presence of O2, it is giving the oxidized product which is galactohexodialdoses hexo di aldose plus hydrogen peroxide hmm. so <coughs> this particular case this dioxygen is consumed producing hydrogen peroxide. So, this particular reaction is performing by your galactose oxidase. So, the general category of these molecules is still therefore, they are also oxido reductases. reductase. And there are some other molecules also which is very much useful for <coughs> producing some very important biomolecules in our body which is amine oxidase. So, we take the help of the copper center which is bound to the protein site and activating the dioxygen molecule. So, little bit we can think of that what we know from the understanding of the hemocyanin, the dioxygen molecule you have which is getting activated by the copper center. So, here also the copper center which is getting activated by this and interestingly this copper center is a small molecule complex which, which is a small molecule that some position is available that means, some vacant position is there and that vacant position is utilized for dioxygen binding. Once the dioxygen is bound to it, then you should decide that what particular type of reagent is required for this conversion from the left hand side to the right hand side whether you need a superoxide or a peroxide or something related to that of our cytochrome oxidase that means the oxo transfer reagent that the conversion reaction and the product formation of all these things will tell you that which particular reagent is required for galactose oxidation reaction or the amine oxidation reactions which is nothing but your amine in with some water plus O2 giving rise to basically it is some sort of deamination reaction RCHO plus NH3 plus H2O2. So, in this particular case what we have 
that means you have you are utilizing type 2 copper protein for this conversion and some flavin containing molecules are also required. So, that for the reaction that means whether it is a catalytic reaction or not then you know that the pre catalyst and some of the co catalyst that means what are the reagents. So, this we know that this is the metal center type 2 is you have the copper site. So, on copper side you can bring this dioxygen followed by electron transfer, you go for electron transfer. So, the nature of this is getting changed. Hmm. So, this then attacking your molecule. So, in this particular case when you have so amine oxidase, so there are large number of molecules available that means it can be utilized for tyrosine metabolism which we all need. <coughs> so, for tyrosine metabolism then histidine metabolism. So, all sorts of amino acid metabolism that means the protein metabolism hmm. then glycine or serine or threonine. So, they play active role in all the metabolism of all these species. So, during that reaction that means these are what these are your all these groups are your substrates. So, this is your substrate for amine oxidation reaction or the galactose oxidation reaction. So, how we go for that? So, like your type 1 site this can also be identified that this is also a mononuclear copper center. So, that is very easy to identify that whether you are handling a mononuclear system or a binuclear system. So, this is a mononuclear system and here now you have less distortion and it is almost close to a square pyramidal geometry and that square pyramidal geometry is fulfilled by nitrogen and oxygen donor. ligands, hmm, but no sulfur ligation. Hmm, no sulfur ligation. That immediately tells you that why you do not have the strong blue color, the charge transfer transition is not there. Once you identify that you do not have any sulfur environment particularly the cysteine sulfur. So, neither you have the methionine sulfur or the cysteine sulfur. So, the strong charge transfer transition is also absent. No charge transfer transition. So, in this particular case what we get that that once you do not have the sulfur one and we are not getting the any contribution from the sulfur and sulfur in two forms in the type 1 copper chemistry that sulfur is sometimes for the synthetic molecule is not so good because most of the time when we get the sulfur, sulfur will try to reduce the copper center. So, you have when you have the sulfur environment your E 0 value for those environment is expected to be less because sulfur compared to oxygen because what you have now in type 1 case you have nitrogen and sulfur. So, nitrogen sulfur so 
without having sulfur now you have oxygen. So, what you can compare the, the donor property of oxygen versus sulfur. So, how that donation from oxygen and sulfur depending upon your charge density as well as the size because this is smaller and this is bigger, how you can modulate the corresponding E 0 value, whether you have a typical nitrogen oxygen environment and a typical nitrogen sulfur environment where you get the corresponding center having less E 0 value. That means, you need some reducing agent like your flavine or ascorbic acid or something that a low potential containing reducing agent can reduce the center to copper 1. In this particular case, your E 0 will be little bit high. So, higher value of E 0 will control something that means, it will activate your dioxygen molecule. So, you have the galactose which is giving you the aldehyde and hydrogen peroxide and you have one copper center and some group is available which is responsible for reducing this copper 2 to copper 1 and when it is directly interacting with your dioxygen molecule, you immediately go from here to a system which is copper 2 and O 2 minus. So, internal electron transfer will generate a species either a copper 1 is reacting like your hemocyanin. Uh, think back that what we know about our hemocyanin chemistry. Hmm. So, from that hemocyanin chemistry, but here the system is little bit different because we are talking something that where you have a mononuclear copper system and that mononuclear copper system is trying to interact with that of our uh, this particular um, oxygen center. So, you can have only one electron transfer because copper is already plus 2. If you just next go try to go for a system where copper is bound to a peroxide system, your copper center should be plus 3 which is not a very <coughs> common system. Hmm. So, something is therefore, happening and you have the corresponding radical system that means, when we go for that binding of this. So, one of these oxygen from this nitrogen oxygen environment is your tyrosine group. So, the minus it residue tyrosine is there and it is bound to our copper center. So, like that of our cytochrome C oxidase, what we have seen earlier that in case of cytochrome C oxidase, we are not able to promote the metal center to plus 5 oxidation state or plus 4 oxidation state sometime. That this oxidation state, if it is not available from here metal center through the metal center, you just oxidize the ligand side. So, you have the oxidized ligand side that is providing the electron to the system, that means this is going. So, in one end you have this copper, in another end you have this dioxygen. So, if you are unable to oxidize the copper center, the are able to oxidize the corresponding ligand part. So, you have a oxidized ligand part. So, you get a tyrosine radical. So, this is basically a metal ion which is coordinated to a radical system. So, you have the tyrosine radical is your ligand which is bound to the metal site. So, metal bound radical ligand system that means, the corresponding equivalent of 
electron transfer what is coming from there that can be identified very easily. So, when we talk about the corresponding copper 2 system, we can utilize the electron paramagnetic resonance to identify this site copper 2. This will not show any EPR signal, this will also not show any EPR signal. Hmm. So, <coughs> this is uh, your D10 system and this is D8 close to your nickel. So, nickel will also not show the EPR spectrum though you have the paramagnetic system, but it will not show the corresponding EPR spectrum, any kind of EPR spectrum it will not show. So, when you have this copper 2 and this O2 minus and you have the oxidized ligand, the tyrosine radical is nothing but your oxidized ligand. And to prove that, that means what is there and which is bound to your metal center. Again, in this particular case also, we can take the help of EPR. Because we know that the reference system, the DPPH, uh, diphenyl picryl hydrazide, uh, so which is also a organic molecule but having a lone pair of electron eh? like nitroxide radical also. So, nitroxide radical is also a very good reference material for EPR signal and for DPPH we know the value of the corresponding EPR signal which is close to your 2.0037 and in case of all these copper signals they are either 2.2 or 2.3 etcetera. So, when we get something that the same copper 2 system is there and your EPR pattern is much more complicated because already if you have something that means this copper which is bound to your radical. So, you get the corresponding EPR for this copper as well as the EPR for this radical system. So, you get something that means you have the signature for the values of this signal at 2.2, 2.3 as well as signal for this particular state. So, once you identify these that means, once you get the corresponding EPR spectrum for this one, this will give you the typical signature what we have learned from your type 1 system or the type 2 system which is not further oxidized. So, in this particular case that means, when you have the copper 2 system you can identify by EPR that it is only a copper 2 bearing system. If you go for the further oxidation for this that means, your radical is forming and this is reduced to peroxide. So, radical will have some individual signature and these two positions are not overlapping to each other. So, they are clearly visible. So, in EPR spectra this is a very useful technique that both you can identify the corresponding copper 2 site as well as the oxidized tyrosine radical. Hmm. So, that particular one that means, when we get whether you have the same system for uh, our copper what we find in case of hemocyanin that means, one such important molecule is for generation of hormone and all these things. So, for the formation of nor epinephrine, epinephrine. Hmm. We require something that means the production of these hormonal molecules and all these in our body, which also bear the dopamine molecule. Hmm. should know the detailed structure also and what is the st corresponding structure of the dopamine and this immediately tells us that this is amine. So, if you just react with that of your copper side, so it will undergo some oxidation reaction. So, one such important system or the catalyst required for the production of nor epinephrine is dopamine beta hydroxylase. Hmm, dopamine beta hydroxylase
and there the tyrosine radical type of thing is operating and the system what we have is first you have the copper mononuclear system and another copper one center is also nearby, but these two are individual mononuclear system. These are not your binuclear system. What we call as a binuclear system? If these two coppers are connected by some bridging groups, uh, like in the case of hemocyanin, and also we will say in the case of the other type where we will find that if these two copper are bridge. But if you have one particular pocket in this particular area and another pocket here, it will not go for any kind of this binuclear assembly but it can provide some long distance electron transfer reactions. So, this particular center most of the cases they are tri coordinated. So, for dopamine beta hydroxylase you have these two centers and what we have learned so far is a very simple thing that what you have the copper center your oxygen is your reagent. Mm. So, it is a reversible one and you need the substrate which is your dopamine and in other case it is the galactose. Eh? So, the substrate is there and substrate is getting oxidized. So, in the first case where you have this copper site and this copper site is interacting with your O2 and the substrate which is based on the carbon hydrogen bond. Suppose your substrate is like this H and H and you have the second copper and in this particular case we will find that in the next step where we is the rate determining step we can find out the corresponding rate constant for that that you have this copper and this particular copper is basically now reduced to superoxide that means it is getting activated. So, electron transfer is taking place as well as your that other part basically this uh, one is there that means this particular substrate is there and you are generating this particular superoxide there from internal electron transfer and then if we just further go for copper hydrogen peroxide that means there you will have the corresponding protonation. And this particular case, your second copper, this particular copper is basically <coughs> sitting there, but it will not provide anything, but it has some internal interactions with that of your water molecules. So, if there is that means, if something is there, you require some hydroxide group from there for deprotonation that means, not only deprotonation, but also you have to have that corresponding oxidation. So, this R and R prime. So, if there is abstraction of that proton that means, proton plus electron and H hydrogen atom abstraction. So, you have R and R prime and one H will be there and this will be your radical form which is equivalent to that of your tyrosine radical formation. Hmm. So, your substrate is responsible for giving you the corresponding radical and this oxygen is further bound to so basically sometime we get a trimeric form hmm, is very common. Hmm, that means, 
So, if you have a very long distance say several angstroms say 20 angstrom or so, but if you find that is a copper activated water chain. So, this copper activated water chain such that its tail is approaching the second copper. So, when you have this that means, if you just go for this proton this is you just supplying this proton to the system that means, you have the charge it you can go for the corresponding peroxide then it is getting protonated. So, peroxide protonation can take place from this sort of water molecules connected to the second copper. So, <coughs> this particular case so if you have that that means, if you just simply transfer this particular oxygen atom that means, our goal is that you have to transfer this oxygen atom. So, like that cytochrome C oxidase you will just end up with some oxygen atom over here and some solvent that means, your water molecule is interacting with it that means, it is occupying the vacant site. If some vacant site is available due to this non occupancy of this particular substrate or any other group. So, most of the cases the vacant site will be occupied by the water molecule and the second copper which is already showing some weak interaction with that will be giving you a hydroxo binded hydroxide group binded copper center. So, this one is there and another copper can go to this molecule to this one. So, this oxygen this particular oxygen hmm, which is charge is also there and this extra electron is also there. So, this basically will attack your this radical formed over there. So, this particular one when it is there so is a this particular center will be attacked by this and copper will now transfer this oxygen giving you that oxygen on the substrate backbone and you have the copper this coordination is there and this copper is in plus 2 oxidation state and in the final step we get something that means either the flavin or ascorbic acid that means some reducing agent is required such that you reduce this copper 2 side to copper 1 side and your product is released from there. So, this identification basically how will you identify that it is going through a radical intermediate. So, our EPR is there you take up this particular uh, hydrogen atom from there and you just generate that unpaired electron density over there and that is finally, collapsing with to give you the corresponding product. So, this is therefore, a completely different story apart from your type 1 site and the type 3 site which is also little bit different compared to this type 1 and 2. So, if we just simply compare that how this type 3 is different from type 1 and type 2 for this particular system also you have the system we already know the hemocyanin then another group of molecules is tyrosinase that means, you can work on tyrosine molecule and you can oxidize the tyrosine also 
to form a catechol type of thing and it can also work on catechol oxidase and in this particular case when we have that particular type 3 tie system that means when you go for this that means if you have one particular side so at least two copper sides are there and if we just rely on the corresponding characteristics structure for in EPR spectroscopy we will find that in most of the cases they are EPR inactive compared to your type 1 site or type 2 site. So, in most of the cases when you find that they are EPR inactive, but you have something where this particular copper site if it is in plus 2 and this is also plus 2. This individually when we talk about in terms of that type 1 copper this site is EPR active, this site is also EPR active. So, we get something that means this particular site which is EPR active and this particular site which is also. So, individually both the two sites are EPR active. Huh? So, this is a 3D 9 system. So, you have one unpaired electron on this and another unpaired electron on this and the energy level for those unpaired electrons on the individual copper side will give you the corresponding EPR spectrum and in most of the cases depending upon its occupancy that means whether you can have a unpaired electron in depending upon the geometry. Hmm? So, what type of geometry you have either it can be on the dz square or dx square y square or vital. So, when you have these two and these two individually can give the corresponding EPR signal, but in this particular copper 2 site we will find that they have the strong oxidase activity because we are looking for something the biological activity and we are trying to correlate with something which is basically dependent on physics. So, this biological activity whether this particular site whether your system is paramagnetic or diamagnetic. So, depending upon the of the nature that means when it is in the plus 1 oxidation state that means we are reducing the copper 2 to copper 1. We know that the activity for the copper 1 sites are completely different compared to your copper 2 site. But when a system is there and which is bridged by something so that means you have the bridging group X when you have the bridging group and then these two electrons are coupled to each other and you get something the magnetic orbital we call. So, the magnetic orbital it can share the same orbital level and these two are paired that means you have some interaction. So, this particular case so when you have this these two combinations that means either you have two unpaired electron or a system where you have the paired electron. So, that you all know that this is the second thing that means this one is your interaction which is anti ferromagnetic. So, this anti ferromagnetic nature that means if you have the levels like this with that individually you have this half electron spin, this is also a half electron spin and whether you have the total spin hmm, is equal to 0 or is equal to 1. So, if you have the ground state that means this state is 0 or sometime close to 0 that depends on your separation that means the population of the individual level. Uh, so, the Boltzmann distribution law is there. So, Boltzmann constant is also operating your K2 value is important 
and that k2 value will dictate that how big your j is there. So, the coupling constant, so the anti ferromagnetic coupling we get, we report that coupling constant. Uh, so, this coupling constant j we report in terms of its centimeter inverse value. So, if the separation is very big, so if the j is about say 400 centimeter or so, so your most of the molecules will be in this particular state, the system will show its anti ferromagnetic property. But if your j value is uh, not so big, you get some population at this level and some population at the above level also. So, depending upon the distribution, the Boltzmann distribution law will tell you that how much is there, the thermal distribution between these two level will tell you something where you will find that the system is not completely diamagnetic in nature. So, this anti ferromagnetic coupling which will show the oxidase activity and you have this particular uh, dimeric system and this dimeric system we can characterize because this super exchange or the direct because direct exchange because in this particular case you do not think that there is a metal metal bond. So, some mediating group like we all the time from we know that the corresponding copper acetate structure, hmm, the copper acetate. So, you have the mechanism we call it as a super exchange. So, through this acetate bridging your uh, this unpaired electron density on the first copper with the second copper is coupled and we get some interaction, but there is no such direct copper copper bond. So, in this particular case when you have these two and if you are able to know that what type of this bridging group is there and little bit we can say from there what is its role. That last case that means the type 2 case what we have seen that you have two individual sites one is one copper site and another is another copper site, but most of the catalytic activity is taking place one on the one particular copper that means this distance is important. So, there we see that the distance is pretty big, so 10 to 20 angstrom, but this distance is pretty close. So, this particular reactivity is all the time we label it as a binuclear system that means you have two copper centers which is close to 3 angstrom or 3.5 angstrom and if we can do something that this one particular copper site that means the first copper site is responsible for holding your substrate, the second copper site will be utilized for using the reagent. So, that basically we have seen in case of hemocyanin also earlier that you have one copper site and in the second is also copper and you have the histidine nitrogens are there, then you have one histidine nitrogen, another histidine nitrogen and the third one just just we are drawing over here. This is there and the substrate is our tyrosine group and this tyrosine group in case of its corresponding tyrosinase activity that means you have this particular flat ring and this you have the corresponding flat ring and the positioning of these two. So, this basically the type 3 copper you have like hemocyanin you have one as copper A site and another as the corresponding copper B site and when they are interacting with the dioxygen. So, in between you have the dioxygen molecule and that particular th identification of these that means you have the dioxygen molecule 
and the typical nature of this bonding we already identified earlier that if you when we study the hemocyanin system that the hemocyanin system we know that this particular type of interaction is different one. So, this peroxo linkage is a completely different type of linkage. So, when you have three quartz sites which are coming from the nitrogens of the protein chain and here also the three nitrogens from the protein chain and this interaction is slowly initially establishing through these two bonds with this dioxygen. So, copper is moving from a tri coordinated system to a tetra coordinated one when one bond is forming. Then we all know that whenever you have a copper center and which is a square planar one or a distorted square planar one, it will always attract another group from the fifth coordination site. So, it will try to move from a square planar one to a square pyramidal one and if there is a severe distortion of this system, it can slowly approach to a system which can be a trigonal by pyramidal geometry. Hmm. So, but these two that means this is a 5 coordinated system and this is also a 5 coordinated system and that particular one that means this initially if this bond is forming first that means both the copper centers are tetra coordinated then through this interaction. So, this would be a long bond initially this will try to establish another bond with this oxygen and another bond with this oxygen. So, it is a typical bond and this system was first discovered in the synthetic molecule and later on it was discovered in hemocyanin system because these two will tell you the corresponding copper copper distance because this is in the perpendicular position. So, the position is different compared to your linear this dioxygen system and also that particular group that means how the secondary interactions are also coming into the picture that means this particular unit which is a flat one and this particular unit is also a flat one. So, it has a pi electron cloud on this tyrosine which is coming into the picture as a substrate molecule because we are looking for the tyrosinase activity and this is also a pi system. So, you have pi electron density and the biologists also gave us the first of all these sort of informations that what we nowadays consider that hydrogen bonding interactions and the pi pi interactions in all these supramolecular interactions or in the crystal lattice we find. When you determine some excess structure we will find that some close distances are there, but in this particular case if if we just the pi pi interactions between this imidazole ring and this imidazole ring that means the orientation of these two groups are important. This is one flat molecule and this is another flat molecule though the stacking of these flat molecules are important that means this particular group is controlling the corresponding alignment of your substrate molecule. You see now we just in our next class we will see that so far what we are talking here is that your substrate molecule is not interacting is not started coordinating with the copper center it has not established any kind of interaction with the copper center. So, that interaction is not there only the pi pi interaction which is the first interaction of the type. So, pi pi interaction is establishing the corresponding positioning of the substrate molecule at the metalloenzyme site. Huh? So, the right positioning of this tyrosine group is important and the pi pi interaction is important to attract your substrate molecule. Hmm. So, the next day we will see how this particular one will go for interaction with that center and go for the catalysis. Okay. Thank you.